Oh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm in Bradford. I feel like uh, I haven't left India. I see a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I feel uh, it was my first time in Bradford, and I saw a lot of chai places, and that I felt like home, because that's the only addiction I have. Um, uh, besides the stuff that I do, besides the work that I do, chai is my addiction. So after if this is done, please give me tips for any chai places that you have in mind. Um, it's amazing. It's my first time in Bradford. Uh, it's amazing to come and speak here at this wonderful festival where I have I've had the honor of meeting some amazing people. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why I speak at events like this is normally it gets very isolating and lonely at home. Um, so when I come to places like this, it makes me feel less lonely. I feel seen and heard. And um, sometimes you do need that in between all your anxiety attacks. <laughs> um, so it does. In fact, uh, just day before yesterday when I arrived in London, it was Eid and I was feeling a little lost. And then, but the government of India ensured that I don't feel lost. So I got an income tax notice. And, and of course, I mean, I mean, how could they fe make me feel lost on, my, on, a, on a festival, right? So um, I had to cancel a few meetings and then spend a lot of time with my lawyers and tax consultants saying, now what? I just paid the tax last year. But it's just I was picked up for a random check, and that random check has been happening uh, for a while. Um, it happens almost every three months. Um, in fact, my lawyer appeared three days ago in a defamation case that has been filed against me for an article I wrote in 2009. Um, and in 2023, they just realized that the article was defamatory. Now, the, I'm the accused number two in the case, and uh, the, pa the papers say that accused number two is a practicing Muslim, hence prejudiced. So I was telling my lawyer, hang on, how do I defend this? Like, I am a practicing Muslim, right? So how do I defend this case? The fact that something like this was, um, that, that, that a court has summoned me uh, for something like this speaks volumes of where we are. And, you know, like all KVRs, every time I speak away from the country, I have to add this KVR that, oh, I love my country. I'm not attacking the sovereignty of my country by speaking about it anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's a very isolating space that I said. Um, in the last two years, I have money laundering, tax evasion, war against nation, defamation, any cases that you, have, that you can possibly imagine slapped against me. Uh, last year, in, in February, um, uh, there was the entire media parked outside my house. It was my niece's birthday, and we were celebrating. And I stay on the seventh floor, and some cameras were parked in the exact opposite building on the seventh floor to get a view of my bedroom. We are getting first visuals from Rana Ayub's room, right? Literally something that, that I almost felt that I'm not going to survive this, but I survived. You know, I've survived because there are many battles that I have survived. I, I had a polio when I was young at the age of five. I, my left hand and the right leg would not work. And I was born 900 grams, and nobody thought I would survive, and I survived that. As Tim said in his, uh, in his um, introduction, that I was a child of the Bombay riots in 1992-93, when India's most iconic mosque, Babri Masjid, was demolished by Hindu nationalists. Um, I was the only Muslim, we were the only Muslim family living in a predominantly Hindu locality. And these were my friends. I was never made to feel aware, I was never made aware of my own faith. Um, my father was um, a part of the progressive writers movement and an Urdu writer. And uh, we lived in a very amicable way. We celebrated their festivals. But on 6 December 1992, I suddenly became a Muslim for my neighbors. And a mob came to pick me and my sister uh, and in the middle of the night, a Sikh neighbor had to throw me out of the bathroom window, and uh, we, we, we were refugees from there on. When I was 19, um, I was growing up, I went to Gujarat, which is where the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was then the chief minister, and a thousand Muslims were killed under his watch. And um, I, I went as a relief worker, and I changed my name from a Muslim name to a Hindu name. Um, and that's when I decided to be a journalist. My, uh, I had dabbled in the civil services. I was trying to give exams, but I was physically weak because of, you know, and I couldn't do this because I had my polio and there were other considerations, so I couldn't do it. But my father was a writer, he's a journalist, and I felt like I needed to be a witness. And when I was nine and the mob came to our house, I felt weak and I felt I couldn't do much. And when I was 19, I was watching other people suffering, especially those Muslim women, um, who had been brutalized, gang raped, whose children had lost their fathers brutally. I felt like I needed to be a witness to each one of that, and that's when I decided to be a journalist. 
and uh, which is why from then to this day, it's been a fight. It's been a fight to make my country realize that the 220 million Muslims in India are their own people. That the Dalits and the minorities and the Christians in India are a part of us, that I believe in the idea of democracy more than anybody else around me. I love my country, which is why I feel the right to do what I'm doing right now. So I'll give you, a, uh, not many must be aware of what I do. I'm a journalist. Um, so after uh, the Gujarat riots, when I decided to be a journalist, I joined a couple of publications till I joined this uh, investigative magazine called Tehelka, which is known for its investigative work. Um, and at that point of time, Mr. Modi's second in command was a man called Amit Shah. I published his call record that he was a part, that he was uh, responsible for the murder, gang rape, and burning of a Muslim woman. Um, I published his call records. I, um, on the cover of the magazine, I said, why is this man still free? And he was arrested, the first serving minister of home, arrested for investigation. I was probably around 25, 26 then. That man today is, not the, is now the second most powerful man in India, Amit Shah. He's the home minister of India. So you can only imagine how easy my life must be. Because courtesy me, he went behind bars. So he, he will make sure that I have a very comfortable life right now. He doesn't forget. Um, and then I went undercover because I had to expose the Gujarat genocide of Muslims, uh, of a thousand Muslims who were killed under Mr. Modi's watch. Um, I wore multiple cameras on my body and took the identity of a Hindu girl uh, who studied at the American Film Institute Conservatory. I did not. It's a fake identity I'm talking about. Um, I created a fake, I created fake alibis, uh, fake passport, um, and uh, I was this girl who was trying to sanitize Mr. Modi's image internationally. This was the time when he was barred from entering the US. Uh, the US government had barred Mr. Modi from entering the United States. Now, if you watched last week's song and dance in the White House, you would not believe me. But uh, unfortunately, um, he was barred from entering the White House. There was a time when you know, we all believed in human rights. I mean, who does that now? Who, I mean, it's not even a thing anymore. Um, I mean, it's, it's a thing that activist journalists do. I mean, it's not even like fashionable. I mean, let's talk about business and trade deals, right? I mean, human lives here and there, I mean, there are so many of them as it is. Um, sorry, I mean, <laughs> um, so I went undercover with multiple cameras and I met all of Mr. Modi's men. Um, I used to speak with a very fake American accent, like so fake, I had to, I had to uh, develop this accent. And I had a colleague of mine who used to work with me at Tehelka, he's a French guy. And he became my intern. Now, in the state of Gujarat, where I was going, where Mr. Modi was then the chief minister, anybody who was a white man was welcomed without questions being asked. So I took this white man. He became he came in very handy. Everywhere that I would go and say, I'm this American filmmaker, they would see a white man and say, of course you are. No questions asked. No questions asked. And I would speak in an American accent. This guy would speak in his French accent. And then we would go. Initially, we met all the filmmakers. We did all frivolous stuff for two months. And then I started meeting people in Mr. Modi's dispensation um, who took me as Maithili. Maithili Tyagi was my name and my colleague Mike. And together for a span of eight months, um, uh, I did not, I didn't, nobody in the world knew where I was. Um, I did not have any contact with the world. I was living the life of this Hindu nationalist woman who hated Muslims, who detested them, who detested human rights, and, and was enamored by Narendra Modi and wanted to make a film to project it to the, U, to, the, to the United States and the Western world. So I was given access. All doors were open to me. I was the bigot who was, who was, who was, it, who was enjoying um, all the living room conversations with fellow bigots. Um, and um, in eight months' time, I managed to get people on camera to say that what happened in 2002 genocide was planned, that the government looked the other way when Muslims were being burned alive, that young Muslim women were killed as terrorists, and when the person who killed and pulled the trigger shot down that 18-year-old girl, he did not even know who she was, which the Indian government said she was a terrorist, which the Gujarat government back in the day said she was a terrorist. With all of this, I, the last person who I met was uh, Narendra Modi, who was very, very excited to see some American woman called Maitri Tyagi with this white guy. And you know, as soon as Mike walked in, you know, he, he knew how to praise. So he looked at Mr. Modi and said, Sir, everybody loves you. Your picture is in the auto rickshaws everywhere. And he got so excited. I could see him blush. And, um, and there was a book by Barack Obama on the table. It was Audacity of Hope, I'm guessing. And he said, Methley, I want to be like him. And then when I went back, you know, I got a call from his office saying he would like to meet you for dinner, lunch. And by then, my organization said, it's getting too risky. You have got what you wanted. You need to now step out. And I said, I do have to meet him. They said, no, you do not. When I come back, 
um, my organization says that the investigation got too risky and we cannot publish it. You know, an eight month investigation in which I literally put my life at stake, in which there are at least two occasions when I came very close to being killed, um, where I felt like my cover was busted and then you do all of that and you come back to your organization to, to say that it cannot be published. Um, multiple anxiety attacks, slipped into a terrible depression, felt suicidal, um, things, and then when I no longer could take it, in 2016, I had my mother has some gold for my marriage. You know, the Desi is here will understand what it means that, you know, you, your parents always keep some gold aside. When you get married, I'll give this to you. So anyways, my, my mother had kept some gold aside for me, so I pawned that gold. I didn't have a job um, because Mr. Modi had come to power. I was an untouchable. And I took a gold loan, and I published like 200 copies, and I kept a book launch in Delhi. Um, it was a roaring success within, um, we have sold um, 750,000 copies in 14 languages now. Um, international publications have called it the equivalent of the Watergate scandal for which Nixon had to resign, but we are India. No such thing happens. In fact, we end up becoming more, in fact, we end up becoming um, guest of the state by the US, uh, by, uh, by President Biden. Anyways, we have come to a point in India where even talking about 2002 has become a, a, a matter of sedition, where my fellow journalists who covered the genocide have developed amnesia over the past, saying, but he's now the prime minister, so we should not talk about his past. But there is a consequence to this. The consequence to this is that in the last one week in India itself, four Muslim men, men have been lynched on accusation of eating beef, that a Muslim family in Bombay has been booked for slaughtering a lamb on the occasion of Eid al-Azhar, where Barack Obama, two weeks ago, when he spoke about, he gave, a, he gave an interview to Christiana Manpour, and he said that what is happening in India is, could be dangerous. So Mr. Modi's minister put out a tweet that we have our own Hussein Obamas to deal with in India before we go to Washington. That's the minister, the topmost minister of the government. What's the world doing? You know, when I go, uh, when I, when I go to the U.S., um, you know, I meet editors, top editors, and everybody comes to me saying, "Rana, what's happening in the U.S.?" And these are top editors, and I look at them saying, "You don't know what's happening in India. Everybody knows what's happening. Everybody internationally. You saw the kind of red carpet which was rolled for India, not Modi. I, I, I would like to make to make that distinction it's because everybody says we know what's happening in India, but." We need India against China. We need India as a strategic ally vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Human rights be damned, right? Nobody cares about human rights. So back in India, it feels extremely isolating because some of us continue to speak about human rights, which is no longer fashionable. And if you do speak at international platforms about human rights and what's happening in your country, then you are attacking the sovereignty of the country. Uh, I was speaking at the United Nations General Assembly on the 2nd of May at World Press Freedom Day. Um, I, I was trending on Twitter for three full days when, when a minister and the government tagged the United Nations saying, you are getting an anti-national to speak, right? My own friends, I have become a persona non grata in India to the extent that uh, my dear friends, my people who I really loved and who still love me, uh, no longer meet me for coffee and lunches. They call me home. They say, you'll be more comfortable, right? Because they don't want to be seen with me in public. My brothers, um, my elder brother, publisher of some of the top most publications without a job for the last three years. Same goes for my younger brother. Um, our families have been turned upside down, my nephews, my nieces. Um, there was an intelligence report that was uh, in a very insidious way sent across to me, which told me that, um, uh, which told me that my nephew went to this particular school. My six-year-old nephew goes to college school at this point of time. Where does he go? Where does my sister go? Everything about my family was in the intelligence report. It wasn't sent to me by accident. It was sent to me saying that we know what you're doing. We know what you're doing, right? And that's, that's, that's where we are. Um, this is a free word lecture. We're talking about freedom of expression. Unfortunately, journalists, and not just me, journalists have become the enemies of the state. There was a journalist there who was murdered last year. Her name is Shireen Abu Akhle. You might have heard of her, right? Now, how many people are talking about her? Why? Because you have to understand who murdered her, right? It's pick and choose. It's a battle of pick and choose. We will talk about human rights if it's happening in countries which are not our strategic allies. But if it's happening in Palestine or Kashmir, I mean, it has to be both sides. 
let's talk about both sides. Let's do the balancing act. A lot of my friends say, why don't you talk about the other side as well? I don't know what the other side is. I see only two sides as a journalist. I see the oppressor and I see the oppressed. And that's all that journalists in the world should be following. And fortunately, we are doing the monkey balancing all our lives, and that's the bane of journalism. There is no such thing as objectivity in journalism. When I went and saw the victims of a genocide, I'm not going to say there was another side to the story. People ask me to use the word riot. I do not use the word riot. Riot happens when there are two equal sides to it. But on one side, if you have the police, you have the state, you have the law and order, you have the machinery, and on the other hand, you have people defending themselves. That's not a riot, it's a genocide, it's a pogrom, you have to call this by, by their name, and that's it's happening globally. That's happening globally. Yesterday, one of the topmost ministers in Uttar Pradesh said that we need to follow the, um, he's known for his, the first persecution of Muslims, he wants to follow the India model in France to show people their place to the people who are protesting in France. Now, I'm not even supposed to talk about this. I need to see the injustice and say, hey, well, probably there's another side to it. Let me do the balancing act. Probably then it will be palatable to the readers. I am not here to be palatable to any one of you. That's not my job as a journalist or a writer, to be popular. I'm not here to make you feel better about your existence. I'm, I'm here to show you the mirror. Journalists must show people outside the mirror. Now, showing that mirror, and showing that uncomfortable truth, which might not be popular, might cost you everything. Sometimes I feel probably I did the wrong thing. Probably I could have led a luxurious life. Right now my bank accounts are frozen by the Indian government. Everything that I own has been taken away by the Indian government. And they think probably after doing this, I'll probably go and beg saying, oh, I made a mistake, probably let's, let's let me course correct. The thing is, the government needs to know this. If I had to course correct, I would not be doing what I'm doing for the last 15 years without looking back. It has, has it, um, do I regret it? No, not one bit. I believe that I have a moral responsibility, responsibility to people who look at me, who look at me for hope, right? And that's what we live for. Um, last week, somebody sent me a message on Instagram and get a lot of these messages saying, I named my daughter Rana after you and I want you to do a video call with her and I hope she grows up to be like you. That's what we live for. That's what I live for personally. I believe that a lot of, uh, a lot of women in India are now s sending me messages saying that my, my, my parents want me to be like you. If I have changed the perception of one person people in my country and the world, I think it's my job done. And that's what I'm living for. The reason why I speak here, the reason why I speak in countries, I go to events, I speak about it, I get all the awards, it's not because I want to defame my country. I do that because I love my country more than any other entity. And I want to protect the democratic character of my country. My country is the world's largest democracy. It was once the moral compass of the world. And that's what I love obsessively about my country. I used to love the idea of my neighbors and I coexisting, that we are celebrating each other's festivals, right? But now we are at a point when in 2020, when COVID happened, um, we have a society WhatsApp group and I was doing relief work with migrants. So I, of course, had to be the first person to get COVID. And, uh, and our neighbor on the, on the society WhatsApp group said, told you the first COVID case will come from the mosque. Right? I can't tell you how humiliating it is to see that. My younger brother lives in the opposite building, which is full of, you know, I mean, these are, many of them are Ivy League grads in high profile positions. He's the, he was the only Muslim in the, in the very upper middle class society. He was made to leave because the people, his neighbors were uncomfortable with the idea of one Muslim man in the building. So they shunned him and right now he lives in a ghetto. And this is 2023 democratic India. We are living in a country where my prime minister has not taken a single press conference in the last nine years where journalists have become the enemy of the state. When I was talking about Gujarat Files, my book, um, which has now been translated in so many languages, my truth of the undercover operation. I have a colleague called Gauri Lankesh. Uh, she translated my book in a regional language in Canada in 2017 she and I were supposed to do a book launch, and I was getting a lot of hate. I'm getting a lot of death threats, as you know, you just heard in the introduction, Time Magazine has called it the 10 most threatened journalists in the world. I know I'm being followed. I know my phone calls are tapped. 
Um, so something had happened, and I written on my Facebook at that point of time. I used to use Facebook, and I said, it's getting overwhelming. I can't take it. And she, she called me, Gauri called me, and says, babe, these are paper tigers. They can't do anything. Next day, she was shot dead outside her house. For the longest time, I felt complicit in it, right? Um, I, still get, I still get numb. I know she was killed because she was speaking up about Hindu nationalism. She was speaking about fundamentalism. She was speaking about injustice in the country. She was meant to be a warning sign for the rest of us journalists to fall in place. So now, I mean, a lot of the Indian government, every time the Indian government is questioned about, but look at Rana Yugi, you're targeting her. The Indian government says, but she's free, right? We have not jailed her yet. Yeah, I'm free, but they, they say, when you don't kill a person, you kill them with death by a thousand cuts. You know, when, you, when I'm on television headlines, three full days, when you have television debates about Rana, you financial fraud. If you Google me right now, the first five things you, are see, you will see is financial terrorism, money laundering, tax evasion. I'm like the biggest terrorist in the country. That's, that's my reality. So when they don't kill you, they make your life miserable. They make the, every morning you wake up, sometimes it's just difficult. You know, yesterday I was, uh, I've started avoiding public gatherings, not because I don't love people, I love them. A lot of my friends believe I'm arrogant. It's just that the cost of living like this is exhausting. It is isolating. Because the constant worry is, I mean, that's what the government does. If, if you file 20 cases on a person, by the time you come back from court, by the time you have filed a bond, by the time you appeared before a judge who is humiliating you, you come back, you're, you're so exhausted that you don't want to report, right? On Twitter, I mean, on social media, I'm called one of the most hated person in the world. I put a full stop and there are like 2,000 replies. The, the worst kind of, in 2017, 2018, I think, I was sitting at a cafe and a person from the government um, who, I, who was in, I was in decent terms with, he sent me a message on WhatsApp saying, listen, there is certain, something circulating in the WhatsApp group of the ruling government, uh, ruling party. And the only reason I'm sending it to you is because I have daughters too and it's despicable. I said, what is it? He said, there is a, there's a porn video. So my image was morphed on a porn video, and then it was circulated all over the internet. In a country of 1.4 billion people, that video was everywhere. And then there were screenshots. And then somebody put my number and address on social media, so everybody, every five minutes, would send me a message saying, what's your rate? Is this you, right? Everybody who could see the video knew it was not, it was a deep fake. For the first time, deep fake was used in a country like India. But for three full days, I felt like my body had frozen. I felt like I was made a free for all by everybody. In a country like India, right, where there's so much virtue placed I mean, on a woman's character, you, had, you were trying to discredit me. You were trying to discredit me by pulling money laundering charges against me to muddy the water so that you discredit me and my journalism. And when you cannot silence me, then you try to seduce these tactics. You know, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about the slut shaming and the way the porn video, and I remember for the first time in the history of India, six UN special reporters wrote to the Indian government in an individual case to protect me. That has happened. At the, but at the end of the day, the mental trauma that each time something like that happens, the mental trauma that I live with, only I have to deal with it. And in an ideal world, I would have given up long back, but I know that when history is being written, I'll be on the right side of it. And it's an unpopular battle, but some of us are destined to be fighting this unpopular battle for those who have chosen to be silent. So thank you so much for listening to me. It means a lot to me. Rana, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It was, um, I don't really have the words um, for what you have gone through. Um, and Rana, I've been talking for the last two days and, um, and I think the burden that she carries for all of us um, who can't uh, speak in the same way, who don't have that voice is um, incredible. And I think um, what you are saying about how you have to carry that weight for everyone because people will no longer speak because it isn't convenient. Um, I think that's a very uncomfortable truth that people actually need to understand. Um, we have about 20 minutes left of the session and I know from actually you know, various people that I've been speaking to um, ever since they've known that we had 
Rana coming here. Um, I know that there are so many questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, can we just get the house lights up slightly? And I'm actually going to uh, open this up to the audience because I know you have so many things that you want to ask. Rana, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm thanking you personally because everything you have spoken about today was so chilling, but also as a fellow journalist as well, I watch from afar what's happening in India and it terrifies me. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask, how can we help carry your burden, even if it's in the most minuscule way? What can we as journalists, what can we as everyday citizens, what can we do to just help you carry that burden just a little bit more because what you're doing is an impossible task and you shouldn't be doing it alone. Uh, thank you for the question, Aina. Aina did some incredible work uh, on, 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 the, on, on the fault lines of this when there were communal riots in Leicester. And I, and, and I think she got a first-hand account of the online trolling and the harassment that she faced, and which is why I first reached out to Aina. I'm so glad to see you here. Uh, I think the only thing that any one of us can do for journalists is to support their work and make them feel less alone and share their work. Um, and make sure that they do not have the burden of speaking the truth. When Tim was speaking about journalists, you know, I don't like it when you call journalists courageous. Neither I nor, nor for that matter, any journalist has to be courageous or brave for doing their job. None of us have to worry for our life to be doing our jobs. And that's something I, you know, every time I get a journalism, uh, Courage in Journalism Award, Bravery Award, Earlier, I did not notice this. Earlier, it did not register. But then I realized you are fighting your battles from my shoulder. You have delegated the job of speaking up to me and for others like her or journalists like her who are risking everything. Shireen Abu Akhle could have just not been on that mo in that moment fighting and speaking up for the people. She was shot dead. What did you do about it? How many Twitter trends for Shireen Abu Akhle's justice? I think we all... Um, I think you need to feel, make us feel seen and heard, share our work, but also speak up. Do not delegate this battle of speaking up to the people who are already fighting and saying, oh, she's fighting and she'll do it. Or she's a reporter, she will do it. What is your, as a citizen of this country or any country or any democracy or anybody in the world, it is your moral responsibility for you to speak up. The reason why we are targeted this way because they feel that we are alone and we can be targeted because nobody else is speaking that language. When you start speaking up, that is when they will feel that there are enough people out there who are watching us, who are watching this hate unfold. I know so many well-meaning people who tell me, you know, sometimes I want to put a tweet in solidarity with you, but then I'm too scared. What if they come after me? They're even scared of showing solidarity. That's the bare minimum that one asks. You're also, you're even scared of showing solidarity. Show solidarity with journalists who are working. It's not about me or her, or anybody for that matter. Show solidarity for people who do not have my privilege or my social media capital. There are journalists out there who are being killed, who do not have my public access, who are not on television, who are not doing BBC hard talk, who are not even being spoken about. Stand up for them. There are enough people. Look at your neighbor. There's injustice everywhere. Speak up for injustice everywhere. I mean, as for me, as far I am concerned, I have... I've been blessed to get a lot of love from people who believe in me. It is yet not public, but I'll do with it. I may have made peace with it, but just make sure that you don't make us feel alone in this battle. That's all I can say. Thank you. I think she had a question. Lady here. Lady at the front. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
other gentleman at the back. I think the independent news platforms in India, whether it's Scroll, Wire, Article 14, Caravan, these are independent uh, news publications that have now come up in India for the last um, uh, few years. I call them the backlash against the backlash. So there has been a backlash against media houses in India. Um, in 2013, I was one of the most sought after editor journalists. In 2014, when I was interviewed by a publication, they said, you can write about anything except Mr. Modi and the BJP. And I looked at the person and I said, I'm not into pimping yet. Right? I mean, they expect you to become up. I'm sorry to use the word, but that's what journalism. If we don't have, we do not have mainstream media have become acolytes of of the Indian government. So there was a New York Times headline somewhere which, which spoke about the international coverage of Modi's visit to the U.S. and the Indian me, Indian media's coverage of Modi's visit in the U.S. Right? One was critical, questioning, talking about the democratic backsliding. The other was. Uh, bending over backwards in its love and fawning about the Prime Minister and the ones who spoke critically were being thrown under the bus. The Indian media had the biggest role to play in enabling the kind of fascism we are witnessing in the country. And I have been a journalist for a while and I have never seen, I don't recognize my own friends in the media. They don't look the same to me anymore. And some of them tell me, you know, but Rana, you don't have a family to look after. We have bills to pay. And I look at them and say, if we had bills to pay, why join journalism? If you had a bloody EMIs to pay every month, you had some, some loans to pay, why join journalism? This is not a profession where you join to pay your loans. I'm sorry, I know we all have, we all have to look at the worldly aspect of it, but the, I, I, just, I, just cannot, I just cannot fathom that my country and the journalists, I mean, I was at, at, at the Mumbai airport the other day and it was a public broadcaster, Doordarshan is a public broadcaster of India. You never saw the kind of stories that we see today. So they were showing a Muslim man in a skull cap and talking, and the headline was jihad, right? Now look at the 300 people who are watching the television screen. Oh, Muslims are like this. They are demonizing the Muslim community to the extent that you suddenly start looking at your neighbor and feel that he's a terrorist. At this point of time, all you need to do is go to websites like Article 14, Hindutva Watch. There are multiple international, multiple independent publications and you will see the in intensity of the moral degradation of the country. Where in 2015, a Muslim man was lynched on the accusation of eating beef. You know what the cops did? The cops went to the victim's house, not to the accused house, to check his refrigerator if he had indeed consumed beef or lamb. Now, these are footnotes in the India growth story. We don't talk about it. Because, hey, it's passe. It's like, who talks about this anymore? And the Indian media, I think, it's, a, it's, it's, it's shameful. It's shameful. I mean, I see media everywhere. I mean, it's not that they are the best, but Indian media in particular, I, I mean, the mainstream media in India has put itself to shame, which is why you do not see as much coverage of what Mr. Modi is doing to India as you must see. It, 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 we had a robust press. If we did, then possibly Mr. Modi would have been held to account. There's not a single publication in India which has questioned the Prime Minister and said, why have you not taken a single press conference in nine years? We are the world's largest democracy. Your ministers are calling journalists traders and prostitutes. But we are clearly not offended. So yeah, to answer your question, I'm really amazed. Uh, I'm really, uh, I think that the few independent publications that there are, you must follow them to understand and read stories from India. And that's the only way you can support um, humanity in the country. Sorry, gentleman at the back. 
You know, you talked about the situation in India, but in the UK as well, RSS seems to be more powerful than before. Uh, for example, if you go on Google and you type in Pretty Patel on RSS, it takes you to the HSS website, which is the RSS branch in the UK. Uh, and there it shows you letters of support from Pretty Patel. And all, if you go down, it's got uh, training camps of RSS in the UK as well now. So it looks like uh, the organization is actually expanding its influence in the UK as well. Uh, so to, to for that, on that particular one, now that you're all here, there is an article in Jewish Currents. Uh, it's basically about the spread of Hindu nationalism in the U.S. and U.K. So I, I, I would strongly urge that you go and read that article in Jewish Currents about how this kind of hate is no longer sustaining itself in India, but spreading wings across the world. To answer this, just a quick oh, reminder. Okay, so the spread of, spread of the yes, I, get, I see. The thing is about extremism is if you believe that it will stay within the boundaries of India, it's not going to. It doesn't stay that way. Hate, when left unchecked will go and bite the very people who let it spread to the public. And that's what I fear about my country, that people think they're only going for Muslims or Dalits or tribals. No, they're not. The northeastern state of Manipur in India has been burning for the last two months. More than 200 people have been killed, but nobody's bothered about it. People are, Indian right-wing Indian ministers are more concerned about what's happening in France than they are about what's happening in their own backyard. So I believe that hate, if left unchecked, is going to have damning repercussions for everybody in the world. Lady at the front. Hi, Rana. Hi. It's lovely to see you here. Uh, welcome to Bradford. Thank um, you. What is problematic is actually normalizing of Islamophobia, which is so much everywhere. It's seeped into um, every other places. I remember um, I'm an academic, and I was writing a paper on Islamophobia of Muslim children in Indian schools. So I had to drop down uh, Muslim children from my paper in order to get it published from the editor. So uh, my question to you is, what would be your message to emergent writers or academics or journalists, whatever, whatever they're doing to be true to their spirit, true to their uh, profession or whatever they're doing to be honest to their work? So what would be your message and? Uh, you know, every work? time somebody asks me that question, my only answer is don't try to please people. That, that, I think what a lot of times we end up trying to placate our editors by, by removing the uncomfortable bits. You're not here to make, like, please people or make them feel comfortable in their skin. You, you're not here to be popular. Sometimes you write scathing pieces, your own friends will write messages saying, what, are you, what, what is this? This is, this is not true. The thing is, a lot, of a lot of times when you write the truth in its raw form, people like for truth to be sugar-coated. You know, nobody likes to hear it as it is. They, they, they want you to kind of sugarcoat it a bit. The problem with sugarcoating a tr any kind of truth is that it ends up getting normalized. It's not that bad, right? A lot of people get upset, and, and I'm thankful that a part of my reporting on India over the last seven years helps help understand, help, help the world understand what's happening in India. And I'm not taking credit for that. But the only thing that I have that has helped me to, you know, Go along, go along is the fact that I know this article will not be liked by people, but that's the truth, and they want to read it, right? I'm not here to sustain my job. I could be out of all the publications that I'm writing. I could be without a job. I have my own substack. I'll start writing there. If not, I'll probably restart my Facebook, start blogging. There's always a platform where you can write and speak up. Um, you will always piss off a lot of people. Like, my neighbors don't like me. I'm not here to please them again. So like, don't try to be popular. And that's the bane of everything. That when we try to be popular, when you try to accommodate everybody uh, with your writing, that's when, we, that's when we, I think we, uh, we, we kind of digress from the truth. Rana, me too. I'm just so thankful that you are here. You're my heroine. <laughs> Thank you. From from all the events at this this um, this festival, yours was the one I was most excited about. And I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad you've been allowed to come because I was so afraid that you might not have been allowed to leave. Yeah, India. I was scared that they would stop me at the immigration again, which they often do. But thankfully, yes. Um, it's a little bit more about state, but first, may I ask, because somebody asked me to ask you this, and it's not my question, but they said, can you, when you see her, can you ask her, why did she remove evidence from the Gujarat files in the final version against Modi and Shah? Uh, the day the book was released, uh, I, I put an article that I want the Supreme Court of India to watch the tapes. The, the, the work is not for 
YouTube and public consumption as if, I mean, when the book was released, the transcripts of the book are the, of the tape are there in the book. People have read it. Not a single person has ever taken me to court, right? So I want, I mean, and if I do publish it, there are various sections of the, in, the IT Act that can be slapped against me. Uh, it has not been forensically vetted. That is something that will be done by agencies. The job of those tapes were for the Supreme Court of India or for the agency, the SIT, to investigate. It is not for, do you think it will change public opinion? The BBC documentary came, what happened, right? There are money laundering charges on BBC right now. So it's so easy for people to question, why didn't you do this? Why They all want to sit in their comfort spaces and said, you could have done that, or you could have done that. But when a money laundering charge was filed against me, not a single person came in solidarity. So. Uh, The fact that the transcripts of the book are out in the book and have never been taken away and have never, I have never withdrawn them speaks volumes for itself. People love asking questions and I'm sure they, I mean, I'm perfectly all right with that. Like you say, other people can do lots of things, but yeah. The like I said, right, they love yeah. shooting from other people's shoulders, yeah. right? The lady last there wants to ask a question. May Sorry, I yeah. just say one last, yeah. Yes, please. Last year, um, we went on a, a demonstration in London. I don't know, it, it was shared all around the world. Um, and it was a, a good demonstration in London against what Modi is doing. And you are right about some people who won't stand up, who are too scared. The people from my area, only 17 of us went. And I went and I spoke to everybody, whoever I could, and ladies, as a come, you know, if you want me to organize a separate coach for us, I will do it. And only 17 people from my area. Lots came from other areas in London. Uh, did, you, did you get to know about it, by no. the way? It was shared all around the world, this demonstration we did in London. And, and they closed the, the streets of London for us. And, and a lot of people came out, white people came out, and some people, you know. Um, but it's what you were saying, how so many people are so scared and it's so wrong. You know, if your people in India have to live what they have to live with, you're living what you, ha what you are living we're with. We're short on time. I'm if so sorry. Please ask you to ask Thank you. Do you have another question? Or? No, no, I don't. Thank okay. you for coming. The lady behind has a question. Yeah. Um, I feel really, I don't know, powerless that you have had to go through a witch hunt. I kind of resonate with that in some respects with things that have happened to myself. Um, I wondered if you had any um, kind of words of wisdom when it comes to that victimization. How do you raise yourself up? And um, another question would be that do you think that the stuff that people experience is systemic and it has its roots in the momentum of colonialization. Because if you read things like um, the legacy of empire and stuff like that, you can see that it's the same players that are responsible for much of the atrocities within all of the colonies. Um, I'm from the north of Ireland. I, I have had you know, lots of things censored. But um, yeah, the same players are kind of and then it becomes systemic I in every day. So I just wondered what your thoughts were. So your question is about how does one deal with the kind of victimization in yeah. feeling. Um, honestly, um, I know uh, a lot of us feel victims in our situation. I it personally, and I, and I know don't speak for others, you ask for my coping mechanism, I don't allow myself to feel the victim in the situation. I empower myself. Um, Sometimes I call myself the hero of my own story. But others might not have to believe, but I, I feel like I'm not writing a big survivor's story. I mean, I survived it, but I, I came out of it um, in a way that I don't see, I, I, I don't think anybody in my situation would have survived the things that I have survived. And the moment I start feeling like a victim, I think I've allowed the other person to, to kind of win or, or have this victory over me. We are victims and there's no denying that. And others, like I keep talking about privilege, there are others who are actually victims and do not have my privilege, right, or my understanding. Um, I, I do feel alone, um, and I do feel terribly isolated, and I have bouts of depression which are un, un, unbearable. Um, I have to take uh, solace in medication, 
But and then sometimes I look at it and say, hey, why are they coming at you so badly all the time? Why haven't they left you? It's because you are speaking a truth that is impacting them, that your words are actually influencing policies, that whatever you write is being heard by a larger section of the people, is resonating with people. So that makes me feel in my head slightly victorious. If I was a nobody, if my words did not matter, would they come at me in this vindictive way that they have been coming at me every single day? Every single day of my life, there's not a day goes by. If you go, and go, go to my Twitter, some, sometimes I just put a head, sometimes I do this experiment, I just put a full stop on my Twitter. Like one tweet, which is full stop, and there are a thousand replies. Stoned, drunk, jihadi is going on a jihad. It's, they, hate the, I, they hate the very idea of me. They hate what I represent, a critic of the government, a woman, a Muslim woman at that. How dare she speak up? Right? She's not supposed to. Let others speak on her behalf. She must not speak on her behalf, right? So I take great pride in it. I, and, I, 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 and I do agree that at some points I felt terribly depressed and I'm victimized by the situation, but that's exactly what they want. They want you to feel so overwhelmed and exhausted, which you're rightly feeling, but understand there is a reason why they're doing it. They want to break your spirit. When they froze my bank account, they wanted me to plead with them, saying, if you do not unfreeze my account, how am I going to survive? But I'm like, hey, you know what? I live with my family back home in Bombay. I have my, uh, I have my parents who give me three meals a day. I'm good, right? So, I do not want to come out of the country. I've been offered exile, asylum, but that's exactly what they want, and I'm not going to give them that honor and love and, and that satisfaction that they've thrown me out of the country. That's my country, my country of my forefathers. I love that country more than I love any other entity, and I'm going to stay there and fight for my people. That's my decision. We are actually out of time, um, and I think that's a brilliant note to end on. Um, I actually asked Rana the same question myself. We were talking, and I said, you know, this is so difficult. There is so much on you. There is so much responsibility on you and, and your family and everything that you are going through, you know, and you are needed, and, and what you are saying is really needed. Don't you think you should just come out of the country? And she, she gave me that exact same answer. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want you to show your appreciation for Rana and for the work that she's doing, for the burden that she carries for so many people. And you know, this is, this is the Free Word Lecture, and it's an honor for the festival to be carrying the legacy of Free Word. And there is the very obvious censorship that we see, and there's the very insidious censorship, which is um, the invisible censorship that is not apparent, that is around us all the time, that is about the things that we can say that we can't say about, you know, um, we talk about this with cultural organizations, funding sources, who wants you to say X, who wants you to say Y. Might it be problematic to platform a certain person? Might it be problematic to have a certain conversation? And these are things that we possibly don't think about all the time, but they are that insidious creep into our daily, everyday lives. Um, so, there is only one Rana Ayub doing the work that she's doing. Please show your appreciation for her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.